Professor, I didn't think I'd be talking to you again so soon after we saw your backyard astronomy, but we've got breaking news in space. You've been imaging it. What's going on up there? Yeah, it's not often that we get things happening, you know, as stop press as we have for this particular uh, event, but there's been a supernova has gone off in Messier 61. So one of our Messier objects is putting on a show at the moment. I know there are different types of supernova. What's this particular one? So this is a type two supernova. Uh, which means that when you split the light of it up into a spectrum, you find there are absorption lines of hydrogen in the spectrum. So what this is telling you is that whatever is exploding, you're seeing through a lot of hydrogen. So the hydrogen is kind of obscuring a bit of the explosion and absorbing some of the light. And that tells you that what you're looking at is a massive star, which still has all its sort of outer layers of hydrogen on it. So there's an explosion going on in the core of this star that we're seeing through the outer layers of hydrogen of the star itself. So it still had lots of fuel in the tank, sort of. It has fuel, and some of it will still be actually physically bound to the star. Some of it, it will have blown out into space in the late stages of its lifetime. Um, but yes, most stars end up with a lot of their hydrogen left over before they blow up. OK, so can you talk me through what a Type 2 supernova actually is? What happened to this ill-fated star sitting there in... M61. So this is a star right at the end of its life. It's a lot more massive than the sun. It's at least eight times the mass of the sun. And it's gone through all the nuclear fuel burning stages, turning hydrogen into helium, into carbon, into all the heavier elements. It's run out of fuel. And the, the nuclear fusion is really what holds the star up. You know, the pull of gravity is trying to pull it inwards on itself. And the, the nuclear reactions in the center are sort of generating the energy necessary to hold it up against gravity. When you run out of those reactions, the whole thing just collapses down uh, and ends up uh, Im imploding. Essentially, the whole star collapses down uh, onto the, the center of, of where the star used to be. You end up forming a neutron star right at the center as everything gets very compressed. The star then sort of bounces off that neutron star, flings its outer layers out. Turns out that's not quite the whole story. That's not enough to make the star explode completely. But the other thing that happens is the neutron star in the center is initially incredibly hot and starts cooling down. And part of the way it cools down is by producing pairs of neutrinos, which then f also fly out through the star. Some of those interact with the gas that's just been flung out and end up creating the enormous explosion that we see. The location that this has happened within the galaxy is of interest too, isn't it? It seems to be in one of the the arms of the galaxy. Is that normal? Uh, yeah, I mean, so it's a very massive star. Massive stars have very short lifetimes, at least by stellar standards. We're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of years, which really means that they don't move very far from where they were born before they blow up. And most stars form in spiral arms. So because it hasn't had time to move out of its sort of birthplace, uh, you actually see it blowing up within the spiral arm where it was born. So most stars are born in spiral arms because that's where all the gas and the energy and all the all the stuff's kicking off. But they don't stay there. It's not like as the arms swirl around the galaxy, the stars go with them. No, you should think of the spiral arms as like waves which are traveling around the galaxy and they travel around the galaxy at their speed and the stars travel around the galaxy at their speed. And they're not the same in most parts of the galaxy. In fact, for most of the galaxy, the stars and the gas that make up the galaxy travel faster than the spiral arms. And so the way that stars form is that a gas cloud will travel, traveling faster than the spiral arm will sort of catch up with it and overtake it. But as it passes through the spiral arm, it gets compressed by the density wave of the spiral arm. And that compression is what triggers the star formation. And then the, the, after the stars are formed, the star as massive as this supernova hasn't had time to travel very far. It sort of started traveling towards the front edge of the spiral arm, but it won't have got very far. And so you'll still see it in the spiral arm when it blows up. OK, so it's almost like all the gas is being lit up by the arms as the arms move around and stars form when they light up. And then, but the stars will move at the speed that the gas was moving at, not the speed that the waves were moving at. Yeah, so the stars will continue. If it was a slightly less massive star that wasn't destined to explode shortly after forming, it would continue and, and continue moving away from the front edge of the spiral arm as it travels faster than it. OK, so the sun, for example, moves in and out of spiral arms as it merrily goes around the Milky Way, which it's done a few times already. Yeah, the sun, has, you know, it takes about what a couple of hundred million years to travel around the Milky Way. And it's been around for billions of years. So it's gone around the Milky Way tens of times since it was born. But this poor one in M61, it didn't get far. It hardly got off the ground. No, it really wasn't. It's, you know, it's, it's as soon as it was born, basically, it blew up, at least in sort of stellar terms. And so actually, it really didn't have very, very much time to travel anywhere. Is the sun currently in or out of a spiral arm? 
I think we're in between at the moment. It's not uh, not in a particularly exciting part of the Milky Way at the moment. Will we be able to go back into the archive of pictures of M61 and find the star that blew? Like say, that was the one, that's where it was. That was the one that was just about to go and learn anything from that? I don't know in this particular case, but it is something that people are doing more and more often now. Um, with Hubble Space Telescope image quality, you can actually see the very bright stars that go supernovae as individual stars before they blew up. So if there happens to be a picture of the right part of M61, then it will be possible to go back. And in fact, this is one of the ways we learn about the supernova process is by looking at these progenitors, these stars which are going to blow, uh, and learning what kind of star it is that, that is just, just before it blows up, how it looks just before it explodes. Will we be able to go back afterwards when all the light dies down and find the remnants, see what's left behind? Probably not in this case, because it's almost certainly too faint. I mean, it, for supernova 1987A in the Large Magellanic Cloud, so very much closer, there, with really good imaging from the Hubble Space Telescope, we've been able to start studying the remnant that formed behind the explosion. Um, but this is just so much further away, I very much doubt we'll be able to see anything once the supernova itself has faded away. Now, because this has happened during the pandemic lockdown, I was all excited because this was, you know, I was going to call this the Corona Supernova, but you've set me straight a bit. And apparently these are not particularly rare events. These things are banging all the time. They really are. And because, so this one was discovered with a telescope called the Zwicky Transient Facility, which is actually out scanning the skies the entire time. It covers the entire northern sky every few nights. So it's collecting huge amounts of data and will find pretty much all the supernovae that go off sort of within its range. Um, yeah. And so that actually... When it used to be the case, we'd find, you know, maybe a dozen or so supernovae a year. Um, but now with all these automated searches out there, we're finding literally thousands of supernovae. And we've actually had to change the way we name supernovae a bit to, to make this fit. In that, for example, supernova 1987A was called that because it was found in 1987. It was the first one in 1987. And we used to just work our way through the alphabet. And then it turned out that actually you, you run out of letters of the alphabet. So then we went into using two letters. So once you've used all the single letters, then you'd have AA, AB, AC and so on. But it turns out now we're finding so many supernovae that even two letters aren't enough. So now, now we have to go through three sets of the alphabet. And so this, for example, was supernova 2020 JFO. Um, and I'm sure uh, the next few supernovae have already been found since then. So actually we're sort of, it's the, the meter's clocking up very quickly on the names of supernovae now. Is it possible, or has it ever happened that someone is looking at a galaxy and the supernova goes off? Like you see the moment it blinks into existence? You'd have to be very lucky, but actually there are an awful lot of astronomers out there staring at the skies, so sooner or later you'd think it probably will happen, yeah. That'd be awesome. You, sh you should be out there doing that. Just watch. <laughs> M M61's a good candidate. You're telling me that's a bit of a hotbed for supernovas. Yeah, it, it is, because although, so typically you expect in a, a galaxy, you know, like the Milky Way or M61, you expect maybe one supernova every 50 years. But actually, this one has had, you know, it had one, so it's had one this year. There was another one in 2014. There were at least another couple since 2000. So this one is a real, real supernova factory at the moment. No one, I think, really understands why, why one galaxy would suddenly produce a whole bunch of supernovae. I think it really just, you know, given the very short timescale involved, it has to be just down to chance. Um, but yeah, if you were, well, it depends which way you look at it, right? Maybe you say, well, M61's had its fair share now, so you want to go and look somewhere else. But Or maybe you want to say, well, you know, M61's on a roll, so maybe we should just keep looking there. If a supernova went off in a spiral arm and you were in the same spiral arm, that'd be, pretty, that'd be a good sight, wouldn't it? It would be pretty impressive. So, you know, remember a little while ago, there was a lot of excitement about maybe Beetlejuice was going to go. Um, and there you'd have had a supernova that you'd have been able to see during daytime from the Earth, um, which is a you know, relatively nearby star to us. So, uh, yeah, indeed, if you were in the right spiral arm in M61, you'd be getting a bit of a show at the moment. Yeah, but you'd be safe as long as that wasn't your star. Uh, it, you want to be a reasonable distance away because there are gamma rays and nasty things. But as, but as soon as you get, you know, unless it really is a nearby neighbour, you're probably fine. Are you going to keep imaging this and watch it brighten up and fade away? Or have you, you got a bit bored with this one now and you're moving on? No, I'm going to try. So this one was caught really early. I think it's still brightening up. So it'll be interesting to map out its light curve to see how its light changes over the coming weeks. Although I think I'm going to be slightly at the mercy of the weather in that the forecast looks cloudy for at least the next week. You were pretty lucky to get this one, though, weren't you? You were showing me you had to, like, thread the needle between the trees and the house and that that's where it is at the sky and things. Yeah, there's a tiny little patch of sky I could aim at. So it's, it was M61 is kind of in the south from here. 
Um, and so the south is the direction of my house from the back garden, which means that actually, unless it's quite high in the south, you end up looking at my house rather than the object. But it turns out there's a tiny little patch of my garden where you can just set up the telescope and see it sort of next to the chimney pot. Uh, and I got lucky and actually really lucky in that the clouds cleared at just the right moment for me actually to be able to capture an image of it. You'd be able to get like an occultation with the chimney pot. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Well, I have actually had things disappear and thought, I wonder where that's gone. And, and it's because the telescope's tracked in such a way that the house has got in the way. Uh, right. Or you think you found this amazing supernova and it's your <laughs> office window or something. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. well, you, you've got to be careful when you start pointing your telescope into bedroom windows, though. Our spiral structure is that when you calculate the precession speed of all these orbits, you find that they're all the same. That's how spiral structure gets generated. It's, it's in the case where you can have all those ellipses processing at the same speed. And that precession, so if you can think about it, you can think about the stars going around and then the ellipse itself is rotating. I've, so, I've solved the squeak, by the way. You know, You've what? I solved the squeak. Oh, good. Well done. WD-40? No, I just cranked the seat of the chair back so I can't lean back. Okay. <laughs>